thank you that you come and encounter us. You, you've come and you visit us with your presence this morning with, with your presence through our worship. As, as we sing to you, as we worship you, as we pour our hearts out to you, we sense your presence. You're, you're here, Lord Jesus, through our fellowship and through our giving. You're here, Jesus. And we just thank you that you're also the word, Jesus. You're the living word. And so today, as we look into the Bible, as we look into your word, Jesus, the living word, come alive on the inside of us in an even greater way. We pray to be transformed today by your word. We just embrace that and we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're ready for an encounter with the Lord through, uh, through the word today, just go ahead and get your Bible out. Get out your Bible. You can turn to John chapter 42. We're finally to the encounter uh, of our theme verse today. We've said this verse over and over. This is kind of the theme of our series, Encounters. And today we're actually going to read through that story. So just a real quick review. This is our fifth week in this series, Encounters. And uh, we've been going through encounter after encounter in the Bible to see how God has revealed himself throughout history. And we'll read this verse just real quick, and then we're going to read it as a part of the story too. But I just want to set this up for you. John chapter 4, verse 42. It says, Now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we've heard him for ourselves, or we've heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. And we're going to read this story today. So I'm not going to take time like I normally do to explain it. But this is our goal in this series and as a ministry, that each and every person will say, now I believe because I heard him myself. I've had an encounter with Jesus, and I know he is really, truly the Savior. Throughout the Bible and throughout human history, uh, the whole world has been shaped through encounters with God, through God coming and encountering people, and at different times in history, God has come to different people, and we can see this throughout history, we can see this throughout the Bible that for, through thousands of years, God would come at different times to different people and have, uh, he would encounter them and he would reveal himself in different ways. And basically all the revelation we have about God is because of those encounters that God had with these people. We started off, right, uh, by learning that God doesn't want us to just kind of try to feel our way and grope, you know, out there in the darkness and hope maybe we can touch him and find him. No, no, no. He hasn't, he hasn't waited for us to come and try to find him, but he has come and he's found us. He's come to us so that we may be found by him. And we started off with, um, you guys remember, um, Abram, right? Abram. And what, was, what happened when Abram encountered God? His name changed, right? His name changed to Abraham, basically from barren him and Sarah, from barren to mother and father of many nations, right? And then we went to, uh, we talked about Abraham and Sarah's grandson, Jacob, right, who his name meant usurper or deceiver. And when he had an encounter with God, God changed his name and changed history through him, changed his name to Israel. The rest is history, right? And then we have after that um, a pretty uh, well-known encounter with God. Most people, most people that have any knowledge whatsoever about God have heard about this encounter, whether they know God or believe in God or not. They know about Moses, right, and what happened in Egypt, how God showed the whole world his power and his might, his ability to deliver people, right, through delivering the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And then last week, we had a real fun one, and uh, it was God came and encountered Ezekiel. You guys remember? Eyes and wings and creatures and wheels, and it was a little bit strange, but man, so far, I don't know about you, so far that was my favorite encounter. I mean, you know, some people think, well, God, isn't, God doesn't do weird things. 
I beg to differ. <laughs> God sometimes does some things that are pretty strange. So open your mind up and a little bit. It's not that God is strange. It's just that our minds are a little tiny compared to him and his ways and his power and, and all of that. So we talked about Ezekiel and how he revealed himself. himself. And we have been learning that through each encounter, we learn stuff about God. We learn stuff about ourselves. And we learn the results of the encounters. And today, we're going to look at an encounter with God in the flesh. I mean, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, even Ezekiel, they encountered God in kind of a spiritual vision kind of way, right? Some of them were almost like transported into heaven kind of thing, but it was a spiritual thing where they could see. But this encounter today is God himself, the Bible says he's the word of God, who was born in human form and lived among us. Who are we talking about? Jesus. So, get ready for a very powerful encounter. I want you to say, turn to your neighbor and tell him. I'm waiting because I'm ready for you to turn to your neighbor and tell him. I'm watching y'all. So you're not even looking. I know what you do. <laughs> Tell him Jesus is the real thing. He ain't Pepsi. He is good old Coca-Cola. Excuse me, Coca-Cola. All right. Now, I just have a question for you because it's for most of you, it's probably not Coca-Cola, but... When you're really thirsty, I mean, like, you're just like, as you say, I'm dying of thirst, right? I don't think many of us have ever been to the point of dying of thirst, but, you know, you feel like that sometimes. What would you, what, when you're really, 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 really thirsty, what do you, what do you like to drink? It's like, ah. Water? Cold water? Who says water? Who says a cold Coke? How about Milk? <laughs> Ashley likes milk when she's thirsty. All right. All right. Hey, to each their own, right? Um, how about um, coffee when you're real thirsty? Really? Iced coffee? Hot coffee when you're thirsty. There is something very wrong with you, RJ. All right. Um, me, I like water, but especially uh, have you ever had cucumber water? Yes. Ugh. That's like. Mm. Or if it's like that carbonated water, seltzer water with a little bit of lime in it, that will take away your thirst like that for me. Okay. <laughs> Kwame shuddered at that. Ugh. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you. No matter how much water you drink, no matter how much milk you drink, Ashley, no matter how much cold Coca-Cola or coffee, You'll always be left wanting more. Actually, probably about an hour later, you'll be thirsty again. That's just the way it goes. God created our bodies to need water, to need liquid, to be able to, to survive. Actually, I, I forget exactly how many hours you can go without water or some form of water, and you will die. Okay? We were made. How much? Three days without water? Kaput, right? Gone. Well, it's interesting that so many people, we were created in the image of God. We are spiritual beings, yet we live our lives without ever being spiritually satisfied. And Jesus came to change all of that. Let's go to John chapter 4, but we're going to start at the top. We're going to read two different sections of this. So I just invite you to either follow along in your Bible or follow along on the screen here. I'm going to start with verse 1. I'm thirsty right now. I'm going to give me some water. Mm. Nice. I'll be thirsty again in about 10 minutes. So, ready? True satisfaction. True satisfaction is our topic today. And it says here, let me just, oh, sorry, let me just preface this a little bit to set this up for you. I've read big, long stories and given you a few points. I've read little parts of scripture and given you lots of points. And most of the time we just read straight through it and then we get the points out of it. But today, I'm gonna, we're going to read kind of and pause 
and pause and read a little bit more and pause. And I want, because I want you to see there's so much in this that I'm serious we could do a series just on this, just on this chapter, okay? We're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do, not gonna do that. Giving you some information as we read it. And then after that, I'm gonna give you seven really important points about, about having an encounter with Jesus, okay? So, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize, his disciples did, like we're going to do in two weeks. All of you have decided to follow Jesus. The baptism is to tell the world, I belong to Jesus. That's what it's all about, all right? And you say, Eckworth Beach is cold. It's going to be like the first of April or the end of March. Yeah. No, it's going to be the f- first week of m- April. Yeah. No, March, the end of March. Sorry. Let me tell you. Caleb and Breen, who else was baptized that night when it was like 35 degrees outside? Alicia? All right. So, I don't want to hear it. All right. <laughs> we used to baptize it in Mexico uh, in, in a river in, in March, and we're talking about snow melt from the mountains. Okay? So, you in the south, don't worry about it. The sun will warm you up once you come out of the water. All right. I'm sorry for that rabbit trail. Um, Jesus didn't baptize him, but his disciples did. So, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. All right? So, where was, where was Jesus and where was he going? In Judea, and he was going to Galilee. Okay. Now, if you're going from one place to another, don't you normally try to take the shortest route? Okay. Let me tell you that Samaria was not the shortest route. Okay? He had to go through Samaria on the way. Actually, he didn't have to, but he had to. Not because it was the shortest route. Not because it was the best way to go. We're going to talk about that more in just a second here. But because he had something to do there, okay, that no one else knew about yet. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. Isn't that funny? Jesus connected with her. Have you, have you ever thought about that? You didn't connect with Jesus. He connected with you. Jesus found a way to talk to you. This woman wasn't about to talk to Jesus, but he found a way to talk to her. And what was his way? I'm thirsty. Give me some water. We're at a well, right? Jesus comes in so many different ways. He knows exactly where to meet us and how to talk to us. And that's what he did here. He asked this lady for a drink of water because he was thirsty. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. And the woman was surprised for two reasons. I'm going to tell you about in just a second. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? All right. Very important stuff right here. Two things about the culture that Jesus lived in and that Jesus confronted and changed. Number one. Judaism, okay, the day, uh, the, 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 the Jewish religion of the people of Jesus' day was called Judaism, okay? Two things about people that practiced Judaism. They hated Samaritans. Number one, racism and prejudice. There was racism and prejudice. Jesus, actually the Jews of Jesus' day, if they were to ever uh, have to go on a trip and Samaria was in the middle, they would intentionally go around Samaria to not have to go through there and and deal with those people. That's how prejudiced and racist they were, okay? The Jews would literally intentionally go around, and Jesus didn't even have to go through there, but he intentionally went there. Just in case you've ever wondered, God hates racism and prejudice. He hates it. He doesn't just dislike it. He hates it. And when we come to Christ, we need to allow, if there is even any bit of it in our heart, we need to allow it to be completely removed by Jesus. God hates prejudice. I know we're in the South, and this might be a touchy little subject here. But we are Christians, you guys. Christians. We do not embrace anything from our society that goes against the character of God, right? God, red and yellow, black and white, and if you're green, you are precious in his sight, okay? You might be green if you're sick, but no, God made and created each and every people group, 
color, race, nationality, it all is in the heart and the mind of God. He made them all. And if you have the eyes of Jesus and you look at another person, you will not see brown, black, white, yellow. You will see either bought with the blood of Jesus, brother, sister, or needs to be bought with the blood of Jesus, brother, and sister. That's all there is to it. Got mighty quiet in here. <laughs> I know it's because all of you agree with that, right? <laughs> Turn to somebody in the room that's a different color than you. We got plenty of them in here. <laughs> <laughs> tell them. I want you to tell them. On the inside, you got red blood. So do I. And guess what? You were bought by the red blood of Jesus. I love you. All right. Done. We, it, I love that about Encounter Church, and you know, and I, I, I talk like we're this great big church. We're not yet, but that, we're on the way, right? But among this small group of, on a good Sunday, we've had 40 people, okay? Whiter than a white cracker, this dude, all right? There's a couple of us, a few of us, all right? All right? All right? You know, Mexican chihuahuas and... <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm getting to you. Hold on. <laughs> parrots. Honduran parrots. <laughs> Every shade of African-American and African from different nations of Africa. Some born here, some born abroad. Filipino, Filipino, Filipino. Okay. Native American. Mexican-American, not Mexican-Mexican, but Mexican-American. Mixed black and white and other races. Extremely Native American. <laughs> okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Robbers from Santa Fe. I mean, like, if you ever think Ashley's half. Okay, we got South America in our little group. I may be missing some. I, I just want to congratulate you guys. This right here is a slice of heaven. Because the Bible says that in eternity, before the throne of God, there will be a count countless multitude of people from every tribe, nation, tongue, and language. And they'll all be worshiping together. In, this, in Espanol. Okay. Another thing about Judaism we need to understand just as bad, poss I, would, I would say possibly worse because it affected every race, was women were simply considered a man's possession, property. Okay? Women did not have dignity. A woman's worth was only to be married to a man and have youngins. That was it. That was their worth. How many of you know that is not women's worth before the, in the eyes of God? Ladies, you are precious in the sight of God, and you are precious to us. And this is also a slice of heaven that not only do we have men and women in our church, but we believe women are an important part of the church, and they can be leaders in the church. Okay? But in this case, for Jesus to go talk to a not only a Samaritan, a different culture, racism, prejudice, but to a woman, it was like he was the epitome of uh, political incorrectness. <laughs> Right? Of his day. Right now, today, that would be very incorrect. That way of thinking, right? In our nation, anyway. In some nations, they still embrace these things. But Jesus said, I don't care what society thinks. I care about this person right here. And that's what he thinks about you. Jesus would, did move heaven and earth, and he would move any mountain just to get to you. No matter what color, your gender, what your past is, where you've been, what you've done. He loves you. And he would go out of his way to get to you, just like he went out of his way to go to Samaria to meet this woman. Come on, tell your neighbor, you are loved. All right. <laughs> Liz tried to say it with a southern accent. It didn't come out too good. <laughs> Please give me a drink. 
Um, and she's surprised because not only is he a Jew, but he's a man talking to her. Okay. Why are you asking me for a drink? And I just lost my notes. There we go. What verse are we on? Ten. All right. Ten. If you only knew the gift God has for you and and who you are speak who is speaking who you're speaking to, who you're talking to. All right. You would ask me and I would give you living water. So I'm just asking you because I want to give you something. <laughs> so connect with me here, all right? Don't get weird on me. Don't, don't bring up racial and gender issues. I'm just trying to give you something, okay? But, sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and the well is very deep. Where are you, you going to get this living water? Hmm. The well is very deep. Our need, the need on the inside of our spirit and soul, it's very, very deep. But let me tell you, Jesus doesn't need a rope and a bucket. He is water that can satisfy us. Besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this will? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Excuses, excuses, just come on. Stop, stop giving excuses to Jesus. And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. He's saying he's given water that will make you never thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Listen, he's not saying I'm going to give you one drink of water and you'll be satisfied forever. What he is saying is I'm going to give you the source of the water on the inside of you. A bubbling fresh spring that, imagine, you, if we have the spring on the inside of us, we never have to look anywhere else to be satisfied. 15, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. She had not got it. She really didn't get it yet, okay? Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Oops. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Um, like, I think in, on the inside of her, she's thinking, oh, man, he's about to find out my dirty laundry, right? He's, he's about to find out my trash. You're right. You don't have a husband. And then I want you to hear this with the compassion of Jesus. For you've had five husbands. And you're not even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. It wasn't. You're right. You had five men. Five, look at me. This is what religion does. Five failed marriages. What is wrong with you? Can't you get it right? Good grief. You've gone out with 67 different girls. Can't you... Get it right? Gosh, you, me you, you mess up over and over and over with your kids or, or with your friends or with your, you, how many times have you messed up? And this is a pretty bad one as far as love is concerned. You've messed up five different failed marriages. And now, and I think what Jesus was doing is, is he was addressing her very, very, very low self-esteem. I mean, imagine I mean, divorce hurts. Two divorces hurt worse. Three, five? Five. This lady, her self-esteem must have been under the ground, below sea level, okay? So much that I, I, I the way I look at this was she probably thought, I'm not going to even marry this dude because it's probably not going to work out. I'm, we're just going to shack up, okay? And so this is what, this is a lady Jesus chose to go talk to because he had something to give her. Relig Listen, religion doesn't do this. Religion puts these kind of people down. Jesus comes to rescue them. Jesus comes to rescue us no matter how bad. Jesus does not leave us in that situation of sin. No, he comes to rescue us out of it. But when Jesus comes to you, he does not point your, his finger at you and say, look what you've done over and over again. He loved this lady. He was not only about to forgive her, he was about to heal her self-image of herself. He was about to raise her self-esteem. Not because she'd lived a good life, but because she had a really, really good God that loved her. Man, Jesus is good. Um, you certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. 
Yeah. So tell me, why is it that you Jews, oh my Lord, insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it's here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? The lady, after being offered living water, eternal life, after being confronted with love about her really, really bad, sinful situation, she gets religious and, and racial on him or, or prejudice on him. Again, this is a problem. Listen, you and I need to get rid of everything that would prevent us having an encounter with Jesus. Drop those silly thoughts about God. This, this one is very specifically religious. You Jews and we Samaritans, right? Listen, Jesus is not and never will be a religion. To serve Jesus is not a list of rules. To serve Jesus is to have a life that's been forgiven, that is caught on fire with his love, and now I want to obey him and I want to worship him. I don't have to, I want to. That's Christianity. And she still hasn't quite got it. Not yet. She's about to. Well, how about, you know, are we supposed to worship this way? Are we supposed to worship that way? Is it, you know, you lift your hands and you speak in tongues and, you know, you run around the building and dance and you sit there quietly with your eyes closed? Listen, none of that doesn't matter. None of that matter. God likes it all. <laughs> Every form of worship, he made it for himself. Listen, I have a question for you, especially many of you are musicians. Why do you think music exists? Why do you think it even exists? God made it. He made it as an expression of worship to him. So, well, what, you know, over in that church over there, they just like sing hymns. And over at that one, they play the really loud guitar and beat on the drums. That Zeke dude, he's about to leave me deaf every time I go in there. And that's, <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're doing great, Zeke. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, and, and I don't, what, what is the deal with Caleb doing this? <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to quit picking on the worship team And RJ, I'm just kidding, alright The point is this God loves sincere, pure worship No matter how it's done and he likes all of it. There are times when God wants us to shout as loud as we can and, yes, run across the room if you want to. There are times when God wants you flat on your face in complete silence before him. Worship comes from the heart. It doesn't matter where or how. It comes from the heart. That's the cool thing that we're going to learn, that we're already learning. I'm, I'm probably about to cover all my seven points before I ever get to them. Worship comes from a relationship with Jesus. So you can worship wherever you are. You can worship in church together with brothers and sisters. Yes. You can worship at home, inside your room. You can worship in your car. You can worship in the shower. You can worship in the bathroom. You can worship at, at work. And you can worship when you're surrounded by people on the inside of you without ever even making a sound. You can worship because it's in and from the heart. Okay? Worship. <sighs> Back to the Bible. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will know, that, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while so we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews, which was reality, right? Salvation, God had chosen the people of Israel to reveal himself to everybody else, okay? So in other words, hey, listen to me, <laughs> all right? But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. He's saying the time is coming. No, 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 hold on. It's already here, okay? It's already here. The kingdom of God is already here because I'm standing right in front of you, right? When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, not with certain, certain special songs only or certain religious ways or rules or traditions or ceremonies. No, no, no. It's not about that. It's spirit and truth. It comes from the inside of you, your spirit, and it's truth. It's a lifestyle. It's for real. It's not religion. In spirit and in truth. 
when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, the Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. Did you know that the Father is looking? God is looking for real worshipers. Will he find one in you? Oh, Lord, I hope so. Every single day, that's what I want is the Father to look at me and find a real worshiper. A real worshiper. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who's called Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. (laughs) And Jesus told her, hello. (laughs) Yeah, there was like, uh, above Jesus, there were these like neon signs, arrows flashing. Right here. Right? And Jesus did something he didn't do with almost anybody. I mean, he never did this. Except for this lady with this lady and then with his disciples, he said, yeah, you're right, I am. He said, I am the Messiah. <laughs> wow. I mean, why didn't he reveal himself so clearly to the religious people, to the Pharisees? Why? They wouldn't have understood. This lady knew she needed the Messiah, the Savior. She knew it. He knew that she would get it, and she did. She said, I'm him. I'm talking to you right now. Jesus, then, just then his disciples came back, and they were shocked. Even his disciples were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? I bet they didn't. Or why are you talking to her? The woman left. This is what happened. The woman left her jar, her water jar, behind the, beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. And everybody's like, I already know all you did. <laughs> Five husbands and a new dude, right? But he told me everything I ever, this man told me everything I ever did. He didn't know me. I've never seen him in my life. And he told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Shorten this so it won't be so long. They came. And many of them began to believe in Jesus just because of what the lady said. I mean, she told him her, what do we call this? testimony right she told them her testimony Jesus came and he talked to me I can imagine I can just imagine it he came and he talked to me can you believe it he talked to me a Samaritan woman the Messiah he came and he talked to me he picked me out he loves me enough and he came to talk to me and he told me everything I ever did and when and he already knew everything I ever did and he didn't condemn me he forgave me because we know that's what Jesus did and they began to believe. Let's just jump forward to, uh, to verse um, 39 and read just the very last part of this. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman said, he told me everything I ever did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days. Jesus really likes for us to ask him to stay. Long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we heard him for ourselves. Now we know he is indeed the savior of the world. Seven things really fast. Jesus comes to us just as we are. Jesus comes to us just as we are. And the emphasis on that phrase was was intentional. I would normally read that Jesus comes to us just as we are, right? Like the old song, Just As I Am. Yes, he comes to us just as we are, absolutely. He doesn't Wait for us to change to come to him. He comes to us just as we are. But I want the emphasis to be on this. Jesus comes to us just as we are. He comes to us. I have said this every Sunday, but today I want you to get it more than ever before. He seeks an encounter with you. Even your desire to encounter him, he put that there. He did. He has orchestrated events and put people in your life to draw you unto himself. He comes to you. You don't come to him. Number two, he offers us an abundant, eternal life. 
in exchange for the old one. And I can have it if I want it. He offers us, I'll say it again. He offers us, offers us, not pushes on us, offers us an abundant eternal life if we want it, we can, we can have it. It's in exchange for the life we have without him. It's not, oh, I can, yeah, Jesus came to me and I can just stay the same and keep the same life and keep doing the same trash I was doing before, right? No, no, that won't work. He offers us in exchange for our sinful life a new, abundant, and it's eternal life. And we can have it if we want it. If we don't want it, we're not going to have it. He will not force anyone. You can't get a new life just because, like, whoa, wow, I just all of a sudden found Jesus. Cool. No. It is a decision to follow Jesus. Yes, it is a miracle in our heart to be born again. The Holy Spirit does all the work. But it is our decision to want it and to embrace that new life. This is called repentance. You do not come to Jesus like this. Oh, there's Jesus. Come on. Woo. All right. Let's keep going. Uh Uh-uh. First of all, none of us were walking towards Jesus anyway. Jesus is over there, we're going over here, and it's like, oh, Jesus offers me a new life. If I want that new life, I better turn around from where I'm going and what I'm doing and go after him. And listen, when you go after him, you have eternal life. Not when you go to heaven one day when you die or when he comes back because he's coming back, right? And if he doesn't come back first, you're going to die. (laughs) But eternal life doesn't start in heaven. Eternal life starts the very moment you embrace Jesus Christ because he is eternal life. If you are in Christ, Christ is in you, and he is eternal life. You have heaven living on the inside of you if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord. Number three, he convicts us of our sin to forgive us. He doesn't confront our sin to to condemn us, but to set us free. He convicts us to forgive us. Not to condemn us, but to set us free. You know, imagine going to a country where slavery is still practiced. Because it still exists today. I mean, good Lord, we have sex traffic right here in Atlanta. Okay, that goes on right here. Doesn't even get on most of our radar. But imagine nations where still their culture is to practice slavery. Would it, do you, would it do them any good for you to go over to their country and go, whoa, you're a slave? Poor thing. Why do, why do we have such a wrong image of God sometimes? It is no revelation or surprise to him how bad, stu- how bad the stuff we did or have done or are doing. He knows it. The Bible says when we sin, we're slaves to sin. And he doesn't come to say, you're, you're messed up, you're a slave to sin, you're lost in sin, you're, you're practicing sexual immorality, you lie, you rebel, you steal, you this, whatever. He comes and says, I am here to show you that I know about that. I know about it. And I'm going to set you free from it. I'm, I'm here to open up the cage and get you out. Right? That's that kind of confrontation. Yes, God will not look at us in our sin and just overlook it. No, he'll let, he knows about it, and he won't leave us in the cage. If we want to get out, he opens up the cage and brings us out. All right, so he convicts to forgive, not to, confr- uh, not, not to condemn, but to set us free. Number four, he gets rid of our religious misconceptions. And what we really learn is it's not about religion at all. Jesus is not religion and will never be religion. Do not turn Christianity into religion. It is the one faith, I guess you could say, in the entire world that is God, the real, true God, came to me and forgave me and set 
me free, not I did all this stuff to try to get to God, which is impossible. Every religion on earth is that. I do this, and I do that, and I do that, and that makes me right with God, or that makes me get to God, or some God, or some type of God, or some something. It's all about me and what I can do to be spiritual. No. Christianity is the God of the universe, the creator, and his infinite love. He came to me, and he searched out until he found me, and now I'm in a relationship with him. That's what Christianity is. That's what real worship is. Real worship four and five go together. No, num- that was number four. He gets rid of our religious misconceptions, and we learned that it's not about religion at all. Number five, he calls us into a real relationship with him. A real relationship with him. Worship is tied to relationship with God. Worship is not tied to ritual or ceremony. In fact, in the Old Testament, there comes a point where God gets so tired of their ceremony and their ritual that doesn't come from their heart. He says, you make me sick, and I won't listen or even see what you're doing anymore. You make me sick. You don't have anything in your heart for me. All you have is religion, ritual, and ceremony. What he calls us into is a real relationship with him that is a relationship of love. I said it. I say it again. God loves me so much that now I love him back. And because I love him back, I worship him. I don't have to. I want to. Number, that was four and five. Number six, then he uses us to spread the good news. I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are. That doesn't necessarily mean you'll stand up and preach in the microphone like this crazy, cra- crazy, this crazy white quacker, right? <laughs> this, this crazy dude right here. Some of you will. Some of you will be this type of preacher someday. Many of you will not. But let me tell you something. Your testimony is a message. It is a sermon. It is a, it is a preach to everybody that sees you and knows you. He used this lady, you know. I love this because... Judaism, this whole culture, women were nothing, and she was an evangelist all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Evangelist Samaritan lady. All right. (laughs) Sister Samaritan evangelist. He wants to use your encounter with him to lead other people into an encounter with him. Open your mouth. Some of you run your mouth like crazy for stupid things. Open your mouth and run it 90 to nothing about Jesus and tell other people about his love and his grace and his power. Use these lips and tongue to talk about something worthwhile. Tell people about Jesus. And number seven, last, we discover true, lasting satisfaction only comes from having his presence on the inside. RJ, come on back up. True, lasting satisfaction only comes from having his presence on the inside. You're on the inside. Are you satisfied? Have you been, have you received the fountain of living water that never, ever runs dry? It's Jesus. Go ahead and stand up. Take a moment and close your eyes, um, if you would. Come to the well today. 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 He is there to meet you. He is here to meet you. He doesn't care where you've been, who you are, what you've been through, or how bad of things you've done. 
he's not here to condemn. He is here to love you and set you free and give you a new life. Come to the well. Not the well in the village, but to the spring. The spring of living water that once you have this spring on the inside of you, nothing else will be able to satisfy you. Everything else will fall short. Everything else will disappoint. Because only real, true satisfaction can come from having the presence of Jesus on the inside of you. Jesus. Let's just worship Jesus for a moment, and then we're going to pray together. Jesus, Jesus. Is the name of Jesus wonderful? Yes, Jesus. Is the name of Jesus wonderful? All the world can come to him and have their sins removed. Cause is it the name of Jesus wonderful? Jesus beautiful 